it's, it's my pleasure to host uh, uh, Professor Maurice Hurley. But I would like first to thank Hagit for the invitation and, and, and also for the initiative. It's very interesting. I followed the one with Pierre Frenier yesterday. It was very interesting. <laughs> so uh, Professor Maurice Hurley does not need an, an introduction. I think everyone uh, knows him. But let me just cite a few topics related to his name. Uh, so everybody knows the, uh, the concept of linearizability, weight-free synchronization with uh, consensus numbers and consensus uh, uh, hierarchy that allows to measure the synchronization power of objects and the use of topology in distributed computing. And last but not least, do not forget uh, uh, transactional memory. All these are related to to, to Maurice uh, Hurley. So even you do not know the name, you know these, these topics. So he received the several prestigious awards, the Jack Prize two times in 2003 and 2012, I think, 12, 11, 2012, I think. And the Godel Prize in 2000 and in the beginning of the 2004, I think. So let's go ahead with, uh, with questions. The first question from Annie Liu is about the, uh, blockchains. What's the future of blockchains according to you, uh, Maurice? Because indeed you gave similar lectures on blockchains and smart contract languages. So what do you think is the future of blockchains? Is, is the pandemic pushing them? How about companies and so on? So I think the uh, future of blockchains is actually linked to the future of Podsy Disk in some way. Uh, this is an area where all of the classical work that we did in uh, you know, 80s and 90s is suddenly uh, relevant. Uh, the people who work in this area, who have a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of funding, but, no, but not much experience, uh, they are reinventing Byzantine agreement, they're reinventing graph algorithms, and, you know, they're not always doing it correctly. And, you know, this is an area where at least, uh, you know, a few years ago, the bar was very low for coming in with uh, technical um, advances. So I think, you know, we've always lamented that uh, nobody pays attention to distributed computing, nobody respects us. And here we have a vibrant field that is just crying out for uh, the expertise that our community has put together. So I think the, uh, this is an area where we should uh, you know, act quickly and opportunistically and you know, fix things for, for people. So I think the future of blockchain is of course complicated. The hard part is extracting the science from the hype but I have no doubt that uh, 10 years from now, something called blockchain, which may not look very much like today's blockchains, will continue to be important. And many of the things that people are doing today may not pass the test of time, but some of them uh, will. And of course, I think I'm working on the ones that will, but that's, uh, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and a little bit related to this, indeed, this last time, we hear much about decentralized computing and we used to know distributed computing. What's the difference between the two? For example, is blockchain part of one or the other? So, so to me, the big difference is that uh, the uh, blockchain world is a much tougher neighborhood than we've been considering in uh, much of distributed computing. That is everybody you know, the world is full of overeducated people with uh, poor economic prospects who have nothing better to do than to try to break the security of your system. And if uh, somebody, you know, sitting in a cafe somewhere in Central Asia can uh, break into your smart contract, then for them, it's a life-changing economic uh, event. And so the fact that you need to deal with, um, I mean, I think even calling these things Byzantine is a little bit uh, misleading because Byzantine comes from the um, you know, avionics and so on where um, you're 
electronic equipment might go haywire, but it doesn't really capture the idea that you're dealing with uh, very capable and intelligent adversaries. So I would say the blockchain is decentralized, but it needs to uh, use all of the uh, mechanisms and um, algorithms and so on that we've developed in distributed computing. But the fact is that you, you, know, you can't rely on one third of the people using Bitcoin to be honest, for example. So we need to move even beyond the classical uh, Byzantine models into an area where things like game theory become much more important. You know, whether something is a Nash equilibrium uh, becomes uh, more important. But it is, I think, the natural um, development of distributed computing to move in this uh, direction. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, this question by, by Hagit, she, she says, as someone who sometimes steers the community in new directions, with all, all of what I've cited, in your opinion, what's the most important technology development that we, this means this policy community, are missing? I, I do think it's the uh, decentralized uh, nature of the world. So, you know, when you, you know, the problem with terms like blockchain is they can be interpreted either narrowly or broadly. And I think things like decentralized finance, uh, if you look at the literature there and you translate it back into computer science language, uh, again, a lot of this looks very familiar, except that it's harder because again, everybody is, everybody's trying to pick your pocket. We're not, you're not worried about crash failure so much as you are about uh, you have an opponent that they'll try to steal your money. If they can't steal your money, they'll try to waste your time. And the number of attack vectors, the number of denial of service attacks, the number of kind of harassment, it, uh, the number of ways you can uh, harass uh, someone is uh, really very large and really is not captured by our uh, conventional models. You know, there are nation states that are willing to spend lots of money to disrupt an economy of, of an adversary. And uh, we really don't have ways of uh, capturing that in you know, the, the uh, classical uh, models uh, that we have. And I think moving into this, um, this kind of decentralized, extremely hostile model of computation is important because people care about that. You know, having free and fair elections, having uh, uh, vibrant economies are things that people really care about. And I'm, I'm still puzzled by the fact that we know all this stuff that they really need. They don't know that we know it and we don't seem to care that they need this. So I'm you know, waving the flag and saying uh, we should all, uh, you know, not necessarily work on blockchains, but we should work on uh, you know, other kinds of security related issues. Okay, there's a question by Eric Severson that is continuing of what you said just before. He, he says that you mentioned that people working in blockchain are inventing graphical algorithms for him it's it's clear for for byzantine and Superman, but not that clear for graph theory so in what sense they are inventing it so so, so th there are uh i was recently reading a paper about uh when banks become uh, insolvent so uh, banks typically lend one another money and they owe each other money and they get overextended and you end up with a kind of a domino situation where if one bank uh, suddenly declares insolvency. So the difference between being insolvent and declaring this and uh, be designing these uh, chains of dependency to make them stable, uh, to find out what kind of the optimal uh, uh, structures for, for loans. You know, these are all distributed graph uh, problems. And they're, uh, they don't quite, again, fit in the you know, classical models, but anything decentralized really is uh, you, you know, graphs or simplicial complexes or um, you know, similar kind of uh, combinatorial uh, structures. But these, problem, these problems are out there, but you have to go and hunt for them. You know, people aren't going to be coming to you necessarily with these problems. Okay. Now you have two questions, but, uh, but are connected. First one is, what is your, your contribution you are the most proud of? Oh, well, whatever I'm working on uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't really believe in technical uh, nostalgia, you know, going back and revisiting uh, uh, things. 
you know, so this sometimes disappoints people. If I come and give a, uh, a talk somewhere, I'm always talking about the latest thing. And I'm uh, always un unenthusiastic about revisiting uh, past uh, glories. Okay. A uh, friend of mine uh, told me once that the best ideas are the ones that I would have liked to have had. So according to you, what are the, the best ideas in our, to uh, in, in our community disk pod city? Just by the way, for me, it's the algorithm by Ben Orr. It's one of the most beautiful ideas. I have. Oh yeah, yes. I, no, I think uh, things like, uh, for example, uh, you know, differential privacy. You know, that's an idea that is uh, deceptively simple in retrospect. It has a lot of deep implications, and you know, it's. It starts out as a simple idea, and then you realize that uh, there are all kinds of uh, subtleties um, underneath that. And I think that, that kind of, uh, you know, it's a little bit analogous. Going from privacy to differential privacy is a little bit like going from deterministic to randomized, because you can't, uh, <clears throat> if you do things discreetly, then basically everything is impossible. But uh, once you introduce uh, randomization, once you introduce uh, differential analysis, then a whole a new world opens up of uh, kinds of questions you can ask and uh, results that you can uh, produce. There's a question by, by Jane Kohonen. Uh, do you have any tips for people working in that kind of uh, cross-cultural research? That's often the feeling that if you try to mix disability computing and something else, it can be difficult to sell, uh, to sell your result in either disability computing or the other field. That, that, that's absolutely true. You need, it's a little bit like speaking a foreign language in the sense that you have to communicate with people in the other field who are not going to try to speak your language. And then when you come back and publish in your own area, you have to translate things back. And it's, it's actually it requires a lot of um, cultural um, imposture. You know, so, you know, when working on transactional memory, I would talk to database people because that, you know, database people have a lot of experience with transactions, but they don't speak the same language that we do. They use many of the same words, but they mean different things. You know, so it's a little bit like talking to Scottish people. You know, the, you know, you think you understand what you're saying and then you think you understand what they're saying. And then when you think about it, you realize that actually uh, you must have misunderstood. So it, it's, there's a lot of work uh, to do that, but I think there's also a, um, even if it's low hanging fruit, if you write the first paper in that area, then, you know, everyone has to cite you. So, you know, I, I actually like that style of a research, but it does require, um, a lot of careful uh, thought and uh, formulation. Now we have a question which is very related to what is happening now in the US with the vote. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. It says that it's by, by Isaac Chef. He says that although we, we are always chasing better properties, we have many good uh, theory results and uh, and so on to run the digital elections that are more secure. But indeed, when we see what is happening with electronic voting, it seems to be terrible. When can you should, when can or should we expect secure electronic voting? Secure electronic voting is a very hard problem. And uh, this is one thing where people sell blockchains as a way of solving this problem. <clears throat> I'm extremely skeptical. Because in some sense, uh, blockchains uh, address the complement of the problems with, with voting. So, so problems with voting is any box that you have that's connected to the internet, you're suddenly uh, vulnerable to things like ransomware. New York Times had an article this morning about uh, how a combination of uh, Microsoft and the US Department of Justice shut down a botnet network that was run by what was euphemistically called Russian speaking hackers. So, you know, th this is a uh, subject that's not going to go away. It's extremely, it's an extremely hard problem. Uh, I'd be mistrustful of anyone who claims that they have a solution, uh, but it's clearly something that needs to be solved. I mean, th that's kind of the great uh, white whale of uh, distributed computing. 
you know, I wish I could uh, say something cheerful, but that, you know, that would not be honest. <laughs> Another question by Hagik. In my experience, it, uh, it uh, truly helps to collaborate with someone from area you are trying to reach to. Uh, yes, no, no, I think that's, uh, that makes a lot of sense because <clears throat> it's often the case that even if you can understand, you know, it, it, it's like being on a conference committee and you get a paper in an area where you don't know and you read the paper and you say, wow, this is brilliant. And then someone who knows the area says, yeah, but it's been published three times. And this is something that you wouldn't know. So ha collaborating with someone in the field, give, again, they can tell you, oh, uh, you know, this, this might look interesting, but it isn't important. This might look boring, but it is important. So, you know, I've always uh, collaborated with as many people as, uh, as I can, and I've only rarely regretted it. There's a question by, by Yuka, which is very hard. What are your thoughts on DISC 2030? Not only from the perspective of what are the future topics, but also on how this research community will function in the future. So, so I think you know, distributed computing is not going to go away. You know, distributed computing broadly um, described, you know, by that I mean you know, everything that shows up um, in, in our conferences. I do think we need to be alert to opportunities. You know, I think like all communities, uh, we tend to like to write papers impressing one another. So I'll, I'll take a result of Hagit's and improve it a little bit, then Hagit will take that result and improve it a lot. And then uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun, uh, you know, improving one another's results. But in the end, you know, maybe it's better for the field to uh, look at newer areas. And, you know, as the previous questioner said, it's not always easy. You know, I have some, you know, when I first started doing the work in topology, we got some very nasty reviews from uh, people who were basically saying, oh, you're just using this to obfuscate, uh, you know, you know, come on, you really expect us to uh, learn about uh, new branches of mathematics. And over time, this uh, tends to melt away and becomes uh, forgotten. But uh, I do think what I would like to see is openness to new applications, which I think will be there. Uh, as to which brand of papers I would not want to see, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Second part of the question is, what would you expect to see in DISC 2030? What would you really want to see there, even if it seems like unlikely and and of course, what are you afraid of seeing <laughs> there? <laughs> so as I said, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about what I would be afraid <laughs> to see there because uh, you know, I, don't, I don't want to make enemies. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, but things that I, that I would like to see, you know, I think you know, there's interesting things about, uh, you know, again, you know, extremely hostile real world environments. Voting, uh, I would love to see progress on the voting. Quantum is a, um, you know, I, I have this feeling that there's a lot of interesting things to say about uh, quantum. You know, I mean, quantum is a, yet another model of concurrency that is very hard to cast into <clears throat> our classical models of concurrency. Uh, and it looks increasingly likely that uh, quantum computing will be a thing. You know, it may be a niche uh, thing, but uh, one thing, for example, quantum could, you know, break a lot of uh, security and a lot of, uh, you know, cryptographic hashes and, and things of that nature. And it's, it's hard to tell right now whether this is going to be like Joseph's injunctions, which people were hyperventilating about and then, and then forgot, or whether it, it really is going to be a, uh, an important uh, issue. So I have a lot of confidence that uh, the, um, that my colleagues in this area will be open to pursuing these directions. And I hope they, um, you know, the people who do this are probably gonna be the younger ones. And I hope they kind of nudge the more senior people to pay attention and, and accept their papers. A question on, on really what you did in, uh, in uh, distributed computing. We have seen many and many results on the disability of uh, problems in distributed computing, but much less in complexity. So now we can understand 
the, the levels of disability. For example, if we see what you did on the consensus hierarchy, how about complexity, the classes of complexity? Uh, complexity is, A, complexity is hard, and B, complexity is a little bit uh, deceptive. So, so impossibility results are good because they I mean you don't have to waste your time. I mean, I, I, the truth is I spent uh, uh, several months uh, trying to build a, uh, a weight-free queue out of read-write registers uh, before I came up with the, uh, the impossibility result, which is one of these things where I should have you know, seen it much sooner than I did. So in that, in that respect, impossibility results are hugely practical. Complexity results can be misleading. Things like uh, sat uh, satisfiability is uh, intractable in, for complexity, but as a practical matter, it's, uh, we make great progress in uh, solving it. So in, in some sense, I, I would rather have an impossibility result and some good uh, heuristics for solving a problem than a nuanced uh, complexity a nuanced complexity uh, analysis. But uh, that isn't to say that the complexity analysis isn't also um, useful. Now, uh, we have a more specific question on, uh, by Annie Liu. She says that she, she remembers you were leading the development of smart contract languages at Algorand. She wonders how that went and what you think in the future is the future of smart contract languages in, in general? So the, uh, we finished our uh, prototype. I'm, I'm not leading the effort, I'm uh, you know, part of the effort. Uh, we, we finished a, a pro working prototype, uh, which we're now turning over to engineering. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing I think about smart contracts is that it's very cross-cutting. It's not simply a language issue. Of course, you want the language to be easy to prove correct, again, because uh, everybody, every, every uh, person sitting in every cafe in Kazakhstan is uh, trying to figure out how to break your, uh, your security. So you want a language that is easy to verify, but there's also a lot of interesting questions about the actual model of computation. You know, should it be synchronous or asynchronous? Should it be speculative uh, or, or, or not speculative? Uh, what are the economic incentives to get people to, to uh, dissuade the denial of service attacks? What are, um, how can you price things fairly so that you uh, disincentivize attacks and, and don't penalize uh, honest uh, players? So I think the, the language there is the tip of the iceberg. But once you pick a model of computation, you need a language that supports it well. There's a lot of controversy about whether a language should be Turing complete or not. Uh, my opinion is it should absolutely not be Turing uh, complete. That, uh, you know, if you're writing a complicated smart contract, you're uh, being foolish. And so it, you want to discourage that behavior as much as possible. But it really does require revisiting all of these uh, classical areas. And sometimes the classical approach is just fine, but mostly it needs to be tweaked and every now and then it needs to be radically rethought. A question, if we come back to to, to, to quantum compu uh, computing. Indeed, we know that in distributed uh, computing, disability is related to, to difficulty to communicate. And with quantum computing, this is much simpler and perhaps with more possibilities. Is there, can there be a connection or can distributed computing be simpler with quantum computing? Ah, uh, if, I, if I knew the answer to that, I would have uh, submitted it to DISC. You know, the, uh, no, I, I, I think that's an excellent uh, question. You know, and uh, you know, I, I once spent uh, some time trying to see if there's some kind of consensus hierarchy with uh, you know, quantum gadgets. And uh, you know, it's hard because <clears throat> there is no kind of standard uh, model. And you know, if you go and ask physicists about this, physicists will tell you that uh, they think a lot of what quantum computing does, if you ask them three years ago, they say it's all ridiculous, that it's impossible to build these things. Now that they're solely being proved wrong, you know, they'll still be kind of sour about uh, this. So, you know, so it isn't always a good idea to collaborate with people in the field. But uh, no, I, I think it's, um, 
you know, it's a question I would love to know the answer to. And uh, if somebody solves it, I hope uh, the uh, future program committees accept the paper. Thank you very much, Maurice, for all this information. I think we need to stop to give some time uh, for the next session to, uh, to prepare and to test. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, well, thank you. This was a lot of fun.